Hey everyone, Mike here from Inside Bowling. It's good to be back on the YouTube channel as well as I'm also distributing this uh, on our Inside Bowling podcast. It's available in audio formats wherever you find your podcast. You see, back in 2018, I sat down with a few guests and I've had these interviews hidden in my archive and just haven't released them. Today, I want to bring you a special interview, one of the four that I did conduct back in 2018 when I had grandiose envisions of possibly producing a podcast weekly, but life got really busy, so I wasn't able to finish that project, but I thought, hey, you know what? I haven't put out a new video on YouTube in a while, as well as a podcast uh, since covid when we did 40 shows here with Inside Bowling. So today I've got a special one for you. I sat down with Parker Bone III and we had a really long in-depth interview where we sat down and discussed from childhood all the way up until the summer of 2018. We actually met at South Point during Bowl Expo for our long format interview and I think you're really going to like it. Now, we know the Bone family has had a lot of success on the lanes recently with uh, Brandon winning three junior golds now, Justin winning the U-20, and Sydney Bone, Parker's daughter, also having a lot of success finishing in fifth position this year at junior gold. Shout out to Bull TV for the opportunity that I had to be able to bring all that competition to you and work the shows. I truly do appreciate that opportunity. But now that Parker has won the PBA 50 Player of the Year, I thought this would be a perfect time to release my sit-down interview with Parker Bone III. Before you listen, uh, we do have some merch available over at InsideBowling.com. If you'd like to support the things that we do here, including this podcast, you can use the coupon code PODCAST to save 15% off your entire order. So here it is, my interview with Parker Bone III, and I'll come on at the end to wrap things up. Enjoy this interview. Tell me about Little Parker, Little Parker Bone, when you were a kid. Think back to then, what was life like for Little Parker? Well, uh, we grew up out in the countryside. Uh, Bluntly, uh, my mom just moved from that house probably about four or five years ago. And the house still stands today. You cannot see the neighbor through the woods. That's literally... I'll say where things all started, if you want to say, out uh, in the wilderness. You know, when people think of New Jersey, everybody thinks of Newark, New Jersey, the concrete jungle. That's not necessarily the case. When you live down where I grew up, uh, yes, we do have, you know, one small town after another. And I'll say over the years, they've kind of all grown together. But uh, there's certainly a lot of woods. There certainly is a lot of deer. There's ponds. There's wilderness. There's, I'll say, you're remote. You're away from everybody. It wasn't like I lived right next door to the bowling center. When did you uh, first pick up a bowling ball? I first picked up a bowling ball. My mom took me to the bowling center one day when I was about eight years old. And needless to say, I pulled her pant leg to take me back ever since. Uh, I joined my first league when I was 10, at which time I averaged 93. And I certainly know that there are a lot of 10-year-olds that average much more than 93 today. So I tell all the kids that are that age or thereabouts, please don't forget us smaller guys when you become much bigger in life. (laughs) (laughs) When did you know that there was a point that you thought you could be really good at bowling? I I don't know if you ever know that or feel it. Uh, The summer that I was, I turned 17, that was the summer that I really worked hard at my game. Uh, I was, I had some local success at home. Obviously, I was bowling fairly good, and I was one of the better junior bowlers in our junior league growing up. And by no means am I going to say that I was the best, but I certainly could hold my own. But my mom was like running out of ideas of things to do to try to help me along the way. And it wasn't just my mom. I mean, my dad was always working, so he wasn't necessarily at the bowling center all the time. But my dad was... He was a 190 average bowler back in the late 50s to early 60s when 190 meant a lot. And uh, she sought out some different avenues. The, the local bowling coach, or let me say the junior league coaches, were they, they were, I don't want to say at wit's end, but they were kind of stuck. They weren't going to be able to help me a whole lot more. Well, lo and behold, fortunately for me, uh, some guy named Dave Davis and his wife Joanne wow. in the bowling center 30 minutes away, 
and my mom sought them out and asked if they could help improve my game. And he kind of took me under his wing. And I say this all the time, believe it or not, Dave was bowling out on tour all the time. Obviously, I knew him as Mr. Davis. That's the way I knew him then, and, and out of respect for him, I would still call him that today. But his wife, Joanne, is really the one that took me under her wing and, and really helped me a, a vast, I'll say, a, a fair amount along the way. She would watch me bowl shot in and shot out, and when Dave was home from tour, he'd come down and, you know, give two cents here, two cents there, but he was a busy man. And as much as I didn't know it then, I certainly can wholeheartedly appreciate it now. So let's talk about college. What was what was college life like for you? And did you did you bowl collegiately? <laughs> no, I'm laughing, but you're gonna like this story. Uh, I didn't know where college was going to take me, especially in the bowling world. I did not know about Team USA uh, back when I went to college. I graduated high school in 1981, and Team USA was it was probably around, but it was very, very in the early stages back then. So I looked for a little bit of, I'll say, college regiments along the way. I didn't, wasn't sure where to go or what to do, but I decided that I just wanted to stay home and go to a local community college. Well, lo and behold, I went to the local college and I signed up for a bowling class. And I really thought that this bowling class was going to teach me something <laughs> that I could use out on the PBA tour someday. <laughs> so you can imagine the first day I walk into class and I sit down and there's two or three other guys in the class. And then here comes a fourth or fifth person. And it's an older guy, probably, you know, right around 50. And I'm like, well, maybe he wants to go out on some sort of senior tour. Sure. I, I didn't know. And, and I didn't even know if there was a senior tour around at that time. And here come one or two ladies in the class and I'm scratching my head. Well, here was the kicker. Some lady come walking in the class. She was about 65, maybe almost 70. And she sat down right then and there. I looked at her and I looked at myself and I said, one of us is sincerely in the wrong class <laughs> and I'm going to find out what's happening. Teacher comes in. Hello, class. Welcome to our bowling class. Needless to say, we spent an hour and a half learning how many boards were on a lane and how many pins were at the other end and what the numbers were. And I said, oh, my God, I'm in the wrong class. <laughs> so uh, from college, when did, you, when, when did you decide you were going to try the tour? Well, I, I went to the local college there for about a year and a half. And uh, right before or at the same time that I started college, I had acquired the pro shop in the, the bowling center that I grew up in which transcended into another pro shop not long after that down the road. And tour for me basically started, eh, I'm going to say, about a year or a year and a half after college was, uh, I had felt like I didn't see the college thing playing out for me at that point. Uh, I was only a glorified pin chaser. I'm going to say it bluntly. I did not have the big college degree by all means behind me. And I was hopeful that bowling could take me somewhere. I never knew that it, I'd be where I am today. And uh, needless to say, uh, it was 1984. I decided to try to go out, uh, do everything that I had to do with going to the PBA school, cashing in a couple of regionals. And then in 1985, February actually of 1985, I drove to my first tour stop as a PBA member with Sam Macaron. So let's talk about, did you have a sponsor? Were you uh, backing yourself? What was it? The guy that I had thought would sponsor me, I really, I really believe that he was going to be behind me, was the proprietor of the bowling center back at home, who I am still extremely good friends with today. And he told me about 10 years after I went out on tour, he said, you know, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was not sponsoring you. And the reason for it was there were two very good bowlers growing up back at home, besides Dave Davis, Johnny Petraglia, and Mark Roth. These other two gentlemen, Charlie Del Plato and John Paris, were extremely well-known bowlers regionally in our area, and they were known throughout the tri-state area. But they went out on tour, and the tour didn't fan out in favor for them, for whatever the reasons. And he thought if they didn't make it, how could this little unknown bowler in my center make it. So then I went to another gentleman about him sponsoring me. 
I couldn't get him to sponsor me. And believe it or not, a very close friend of mine, Ron Paget, knew the same guy and went over and explained to him and said, Jerry, you really need to stand behind him. He has potential. I think he's got a chance. And his name was Jerry Connor. So it's 1985. You bowl 22 events, no titles, two caches. How you feeling? <laughs> Not very good. <laughs> Not very good. Uh, uh, it, it was a long road. I can I can tell you that sincerely. Uh, I, my first 10 events, no cash. I finally broke the ice and cashed in Denver and didn't cash for 10 more weeks after that. So I was 1 for 21. And if I tell you being 1 for 21, feeling demoralized, spending a lot of money, not uh, I'm not living high off the hog, you know, but I was spending money left and right. And I'm like, I, I'm not making anything in return. And I felt really bad about it. I really did. Trying to shave corners. You know, you, you got two guys, maybe three guys into a room. You're sharing a rental car with somebody or you're driving from stop to stop. You're not flying by no means first class at that point. And uh, just trying to get around to make ends meet. I did feel like I was getting better each week. But when you're getting better and you still have no paycheck to show sure. for it. Yeah, it's brutal. It's, it's pretty hard to, you know, explain that to somebody. But uh, he stuck behind me through thick and thin. Yeah, uh, let's get to 1986. 25 events, five caches, two match plays. A little bit better. Mm -hmm. Gaining I, a little bit of confidence. Yeah, yeah. I definitely had a turnaround there. And, and you know, one of the turnarounds, believe it or not, was uh, it, first was the sponsor. I, I didn't want him to lose money or continue to lose money. And as much as I lost money that year on tour, I made a little over 10000 in the regionals. So I was certainly making good money at home. So I threw in all the regional tournaments and said, let's put this into the kitty. Hopefully you're not going to lose money this year, and hopefully I'm going to make money. He said he totally agreed to it, so I had the same sponsor for the following year again. And uh, then with a little bit of John Jowdy's help along the way, he, uh, my mom tapped him on the shoulder and asked him if he could help her son. And needless to say, uh, John took me out under his wing and showed me one or two things. The biggest thing that he helped me, I went from five steps to four steps. I had been five steps basically from when Davis and his wife Joanne had, had helped me grow up. But uh, I'll say through my teenage years, my older teenage years into my early 20s, and I had a fair amount of success, John said, you know, you take that first step and you're not doing anything with the ball. He said, it's a momentum step. He goes, yeah. He goes, well, would you put your double ball bag over your shoulder and go walk through Central Park in New York City? <laughs> and I laughed. I said, of course not. He goes, well, let's get rid of that step. It's a problem looking for a place to happen. Lo and behold, I worked on it real hard for three days. Would you believe the very next tournament I made my first top 24 match play on tour? And was that in 86 then? Yes. Okay. Yep. So my first top 24, I said, there must be something good that's happening here. Now I've got some proof. Yeah, the 1987, 28 events, 15 caches, 10 match play appearances, four TV finals, and let's talk about Seattle. Yeah, that was uh, the dream come true right there. Uh, you know, this is my third year out on tour. I did break even my second year. And uh, the, winner, the winner went off really, really well. I made a couple of match plays. My first telecast was in February, believe it or not, in Peoria, Illinois, where my Landmark very first... Landmark Lanes. Landmark Lanes, but that's where my first PBA event was, PBA National Tour stop was, as a PBA member. Keep in mind, I did win a stop, or win spots as an amateur, into Long Island and Connecticut. But I uh, went back to Landmark, and, and uh, lo and behold, found myself making the TV show. I remember that Friday night vividly. I, I don't think I slept more than half an hour the whole night. I was tossing and turning, looking at, at the clock every five minutes. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? But uh, things can progressively kept continuing to get better. And, and then I find myself in Seattle in, in June. And uh, progressing along, I end up leading the tournament. And I remember bowling Scott Devers. We bowled in a title match. And if you go back and look at it, you'll see after five frames, they broke for commercial. And to this day, I remember... Looking right at Scott, we were dead tied to the pin. I shook his hand and I said, well, bud, I said, neither one of us are in the tournament of champions. Go out, bowl the next five frames, bowl great. If you win, congratulations. Good luck at the TSC. If I happen to win, do me a favor. Please work real hard and go back and get him next week. 
and hopefully it'll be yours. And believe it or not, I won the title, and three weeks later he won his first title. You said that right to him. Yeah, I sure did. <laughs> wow, and then in 1990, uh, that was a good year for you. You actually won three titles in 1990, and you cashed in 24, 35 events. Uh, let's talk about 1990 a little bit. What uh, I, You were gaining a lot of confidence then. Yeah, 1990, uh, you know, it, it really started off with some strong match plays and a TV show early on in the season. Things looked like they were, I'll say, coming out of the gate very strong. And then I found myself going to New or- down to New Orleans. We went to Kenner, Louisiana, and uh, I was fortunate to make match play, and it was Andy Nyer and myself that made match play. And when we went along there in the match play portion of the tournament, I could play the gutter, but I also had a second look at the second arrow. And I don't know why it formulated that way, but it was just strange. So when I got to a pair, if I threw it up the gutter, and God knows I love to play the gutter, if the ball didn't hook and it missed the head pin, I moved immediately to the second arrow. And Andy Nyer stayed out of the gutter the entire tournament. And I think if you go back and look at the match play records for that tournament, uh, obviously I think I led the tournament, but I think Andy was in 23rd or 24th because some pairs, it didn't matter what you did, the ball wouldn't hook off the gutter. And uh, it just, it was, I'll say, miraculous. I ended up bowling Mike Edwards for the title. And uh, Mike Edwards, literally ever since that time, we have been very good friends, and I think we will be till the end of time. So you had, a, you had a great 90s. Um, in 1999, 24 events, 20 caches, 16 match play appearances, 11 TV finals, and five titles. 99, was a, that was really a, a total gangbuster year. You know, it just seemed like if, if things could go right, they were going to go right. If I needed something to happen in my favor, it went my way. If I needed somebody to... Uh, give me an opening or a chance they not only gave me the opening or the chance but then I was able to walk through open the door and shut it right back in somebody else and it was just amazing when I when I look at the things that happened that year the things that I accomplished you know winning five titles in a year let's face it there's not many bowlers that can literally put that on their resume winning a handful of titles and I know that the tour is not now what it used to be at one time and and I cross my fingers and pray to God that it, it certainly turns around tenfold for the younger guys that are out here right now. But uh, that being the case, it was it was a year that was captivated when I look at the end of the year and I go, you did it. You achieved something that, that bowlers only dream of. In 2000, you got inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame uh, just after that awesome year. How was that for you? <laughs> You'll laugh when I tell you the PBA Hall of Fame was my very first Hall of Fame. I was not enshrined in any other Hall of Fame prior to that point. And I couldn't believe it when I got the phone call from the commissioner saying that I was going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Because I'm looking at it going, I'm 35 years old. I still feel pretty healthy. I certainly hope that I'm not done winning out on tour. But uh, it, I got to get up here and make a speech, uh, let me say, in front of my peers and, and people that I really look up to. And I'm going into the PBA Hall of Fame. You dream of being in the PBA Hall of Fame. And here I am. I'm, my first Hall of Fame is going to be the pinnacle. So all the other ones are going to be a little bit stepped down. So it was pretty incredible. Gives me chills just thinking about it. 2001, 2002, five titles again, 30 events, 27 caches, nine TV appearances. So, I mean, you were really having a hell of a run between 1999, getting into the Hall of Fame in 2000, and in 2001, 2002 season. That was uh, the prime of your career Everything was, was, was going good for you. What was the formula there that was just working so well for you? I think everything was just full steam ahead. You know, uh, the 2001-2002 season, it, it really, when you look at that and people say, well, why was it two years there or a year and a half? It was an 18-month compilation of what formulated player of the year. So theoretically, when all the other past players of the year were January to December, this was 18 months. So, you know, somebody might say, well, maybe you need an asterisk next to your name because it was a year and a half. It's just the way that the PBA was trying something a little bit different there. But for bowling, for me, I just kept going week in and week out, trying to do the best that I could. I could see the lane better than I ever did. I had confidence that was going to be unparalleled at that time, especially for guys that were looking to try to go out and grab something. It didn't mean that you were going to run over players like Mike Albee, 
uh, or Norm Duke or Walter Ray Williams or Mark Roth because those players are established. They don't care who you are. They're great players. But I was certainly well on my way to making a name for myself. And more importantly, Brunswick was with me every step along the way and giving me the best products. And needless to say, sky was the limit. Yeah, let's talk about Brunswick a little bit. Um, when I think of you, I think of Derek Jeter, Tony Gwynn, Stan Musial, Cal Ripken Jr., some you know, baseball players that have been with one team their entire career, and you've been with Brunswick your entire career. That's pretty special. It, you know, it, it really is. It's almost surreal when I look at that. I, I'm going to fill you in on a, a little funny story that when this all came about, it was in November of 1988. I'm going to sit there bluntly and tell you that this kid that's 25 years old that's got one tour title on tour, he's made a handful of TV shows, he gets offered a contract. Okay? The first offering for the contract comes from some guy named Johnny Petraglia and Brunswick. So, Knowing Johnny, everyone knows how close I am and how good friends that we have become for many, many years. But also on the staff at the time was Dave Davis and some other guy that, well, most people have heard of in the bowling world named Mark Roth. So you look at the three of them. They all lived within 30 minutes of my house growing up. So I could pick their brain. There were things that I could talk to them about bowling. And each day that goes went by, I, was, I felt like I was getting better. Well, back to this November of 1988, the other gentleman that gave me an offer of a contract was within 24 hours, and I don't know who was first, but it was within 24 hours of a contract that Johnny Petraglia gave me with Brunswick. And when I tell you the other gentleman's name in a second here, keep in mind, I had to go back to him and tell him, thank you very much, but I've decided to go in another direction. The player that probably every bowler to this day has nothing but respect for some guy named Dick Weber in AMF. So That's, Dick Weber came to you and mm -hmm. offered you a deal at the same time Johnny Petraglia did. He sure did. Sure did. And when you look at the two of them, there's not many people that are close to where the two of them stand as far as total respect. Wow. What a hard decision. Uh, it was not an easy one at that point. And what I did is I, I went with my heart. I went with the company that I felt was doing – I'll say the biggest innovations, the biggest changes, the ones that were behind their players and everything that they could do. But then I also had to go with a little bit more of the loyalty for the friendships and the people that, well, these guys that I just mentioned to you answered all of my questions whenever I had them. And not that Mr. Weber, as I used to call him, okay, not that Dick Weber wouldn't answer my questions because he sincerely would by all means, but I didn't live within 30 minutes of Dick no, Weber. Exactly. I lived within 30 minutes of these other three great PBA superstars. So not only have you been with Brunswick for so long, but you also um, have become a salesman with Brunswick. How did that come about? Um, obviously with, with the tour not being a guaranteed income, I'm sure that really helped you out being a, a salesman for Brunswick when they offered you the job. It was uh, actually quite an honor. Uh, getting an offer to be part of a, the Salesforce team. Brian Graham with Brunswick uh, literally put that one out on the table a couple of years ago. Um, and I'll say it bluntly, I can't thank him enough for giving me that opportunity. Do I know that I'm doing the job exactly the way that I should? You know what? There's not a day that goes by that you always don't try to figure out how to do something a little bit better. And I'm going to take that job just like I do out on the lanes. I try to do the best I can. But I'm still fortunate. Brian has allowed me the fortunate pleasure of bowling as many events as I want to bowl or participate in. But at the same time, I can also pick up the cell phone. And I'm going to say it right here because I just picked up my cell phone sitting on this table here. I can pick up the cell phone and call as many pro shops as I can possibly fit into a given day or where time permits and try to talk to them and literally get them to, to buy what I feel is some of the best products out on the market. Over the years, the best products on the market, as you said, uh, what are some of your favorite bowling balls of all time that Brunswick's brought, <laughs> brought to market? I'm putting you on the spot here. Well, how can I not say a Rhino? That's what I won my first title with. Yeah. You know, you got the Rhino. The, the innovator that really changed a lot of things for Brunswick would have been the Rhino Pro Series. The Purple Rhino Pro, the Teal Rhino Pro. 
oh my God, did things change immensely for our company as a whole at that point. You've got the speed zone. You've got the inferno. You know, you've got balls like that that, I mean, they just opened your eyes up and you kept looking at them going, is this, is it surreal right now? You know, and I know that we've come out with plenty of newer balls since then, but I'll say being, a, a, you know, looking back in time, Speed Zone and Inferno, they're the two that, that really make it, but I, I can't can't go without saying forgetting my purple rhino pro and my teal rhino pro those those balls were they they said a lot for me i specifically remember you peeling a danger zone off the one or two board in some telecast and that ball was just kicked to the right and i i know you sold a lot of bowling balls (laughs) for brunswick on that show well the you know guys tell me that the danger zone the the green tracer zone we had that one too it was a, a pearlized green tracer they did. They sincerely matched up great. I remember one year I won the Japan Cup, and when I got done, I had to sign the ball that I won with, and they put it in the trophy case, and that's where they kept it, right at the Japan Cup in the bowling center. Well, I come back the following year to bowl the tournament, and the lanes were just a little bit different. They weren't exactly the same. But I went out and bowled the first round, and I'm like, you know, I wish I had a ball that did this. I wish I had a ball that did that. And Well, finally, I asked our tournament director. I said, uh, Hey, am I allowed to use a ball that's got my name on it in a trophy case? He goes, well, of course you can. You know, just got to take your name off of it. Well, that's what I did. Took my name off of it. Wouldn't you know, I went out with the same green tracer, ended up leading the tournament, won the Japan Cup again, re-signed the ball, and put it back oh, in the trophy my. case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I remember at that time Power Coil, I believe, was the name of the Power cover Coil song. 18. Yeah, that was, that was the magic sauce at the time. It sure was. Driving down the road being a, being a sales guy. Um, what do you think about when you're driving down the road? You know, you, you try to touch upon somebody that you can make a difference. Uh, yes, don't get me wrong. I want to see pro shops and bowling centers be a part of Brunswick or, or become a part of our team to some capacity. Now, what does that mean, become a part of our team? You know, I, I'm a firm believer that you can go out and you can try to sell everything. I'm not telling you to be locked into just us. But I'd like you to at least open your eyes to give us a try. I know that we have got some of the best products out there. And there's a lot of products from a lot of different companies that are very, very good. No question about it. But when you're closed-minded and you don't throw something else or you don't at least try something else. And I'm different because I'm with the company. But 99.999% of the people that play our sport are free, have free reign to do anything Absolutely. they want. Absolutely. And... Uh, I think that you're leaving a lot of pins out on the table or out on the deck that you don't know about without giving it a try. Not every ball is for every person, but I'm a firm believer that every company certainly has a ball for somebody. Yep, a mixed bag is the majority in bowling, and I think uh, everybody having a mixed bag and trying a little bit of everything is, is the way to go if you can. Yep, so when I when I go around, I just, I just want to see people enjoy the sport for what it has to offer. And when I say those things, you know, I could learn something that happened to me in Japan or or possibly Australia, that I think they could lose in a bowl, use in a bowling center right here back at home. And at the same time, I might learn something while I'm in Las Vegas that could be totally usable when I'm over in Europe. So you bounce ideas. You, you see what goes on there. By no means am I a bowling center owner or operator. But I just throw the idea out, and even if I'm giving it to you, Mike, you know what? You can take it and run with it. I'm going to turn and go do my next thing. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about home life a little bit. Let's talk about Leslie. I want to know, did you ask Leslie out or did or did she pursue you? <laughs> I'm the one that, that asked Leslie out. I, I pushed that envelope there. I, uh, I had met her one year in Reno, and uh, I told her, I said, hey, I said, uh, would you like to go out to dinner tonight? And uh, I said, my friends, bluntly, my friends doused me. They, they said that they can't go. So she goes, oh, so I'm an afterthought. So, and that's what she tells everybody too. I said, no, it's not that you're an afterthought, but they didn't want to go out. And I was, I figured I'd ask you if you'd like to go. And she goes, no. So I'm an afterthought. And uh, as it was, she said, no, she didn't want to go out to dinner. She was going home to cook. So I said, okay, well then I'll come over there. So I kind of pushed my way in the door, so to speak. But uh, she's a bowler too. She's a bowler. She certainly is a bowler. I give her no lip when it comes to bowling on the lanes. Trust me. She's beaten me more than once. 
So, and I, I'll say it bluntly that I, I've done plenty of exhibitions and appearances and a, a couple of them with Leslie there. And uh, one of them particular, I had to bowl three games, Mike, and I shot 675 for my three <laughs> games. Lost not one, not two, but all three <laughs> games to Leslie. So I looked at her and I go, are you kidding me? She goes, oh, I was just lucky. So for the next six months, as a guy that goes out and does exhibitions and appearances, and you as a man can totally respect this, when I loaded the car to go do my stuff at the exhibition, I politely left her stuff in the garage. Yeah, that's the, yeah you had okay. to at that point, right? So, uh, you know, six months goes by, her stuff's in the car. She asked me if she could go bowl on someplace. Uh, you sure? You going to beat me again? She goes, no, I got lucky that day. I shoot 700 for my three games. Deja vu all over again. I lose all three games. So we get in the car. I go, maybe you should start bowling for a living. And, and I'll sit in the back and watch. She goes, oh, no. I bowl for play. You bowl for pay. I'm happy with the way things are right now. How long have you guys been married? We've been married 17 years now. Coming up. 17 years coming up in just a couple of weeks. I got to ask because uh, I saw it a lot. The Lumber Liquidators commercial. Did they approach you about doing that commercial in your house? Did you just need some new floors? How did that come about? They actually approached us. They got in touch with me to see if I'd be interested in doing a commercial for Lumber Liquidators. Part of the campaign, they were going to come in and put flooring in, in one of the rooms in our house. And I guess that they didn't realize that our house was not 22,000 square feet like maybe some other athletes, that we had a normal size home. So they actually put hardwood floors in our kitchen, in our pool room, and in our dining room, uh, which led into the foyer there. But make a long story short, it all worked out really, really good at the end. But one problem. First of all, if you've watched a commercial, Mike, you see that my <laughs> wife never let me get a word in edgewise. To this day, I still couldn't talk about it. And I had all those pins set up perfectly in our foyer. I was ready to knock them all over. And what are those famous words she said? Parker, don't, don't even, even think, think about, about it. it. Yeah. <laughs> how many takes or how long did it take to get that commercial done? I tell people this, that the first two gentlemen came to our door at 630 in the morning. The last two gentlemen left at 1045 in the evening. There were about a crew of 25 people to make two 30-second commercials. They had a tractor trailer parked in front of our house with a bunch of furniture in it that they used inside for the purposes of making this commercial. With all the cars that were parked up and down the street <laughs> in our development, if nobody in our development knew what I did prior to that day, they certainly all knew by the end of that day. <laughs> Where do you keep your trophies? Uh, throughout the house, actually. Really? Uh, yeah, we, we've... I say we've got them in our foyer. We've got them in our main entrance. We've got them down in our basement on a, I got a nice shelf for, for some of the crystal trophies that I, I've acquired through the years. Uh, we've got them on our mantle in our pool room. We've got some of them in our living room. But I have to say, honestly, Mike, I think that my trophies are starting to get pushed aside a little bit because the kids are winning more trophies uh, any more than, than I am. <laughs> yeah, junior gold last year i was there i got to see it um you've got a great family and they picked up bowling uh did you know that was going to happen i don't think anybody ever knew it would happen you hope that your kids whatever they do in life that they enjoy or love uh at least i know i hope that they love it as much as i do but uh it, it's it actually was two weeks before junior gold justin had won the u15 division at teen masters and that was his biggest tournament win that he ever won. And that was the most that either of the boys had ever won in one single day competing or a single event rather. And then two weeks later or three weeks later, Brandon, lo and behold, ends up bowling for the junior gold title in the U-12 division and ends up winning against a young man there from South Carolina. And uh, I just, I sat back and I'm looking at this going, I'm watching my son bowl on national TV. What, what, where am I missing? What am I, where did this all come about here all of a sudden? So, uh, but the two of them push each other endlessly. They want to strive to get better. And, uh, you know, I got to tell everybody that's listening in. Folks, I know that I'm Parker Bone. I'm the professional bowler. 
that guy that maybe you've seen on TV for the last 20 or 30 years. But God bless everybody that goes through this in this world. My two kids are no different than every other kid at home. I'm dad. So if you think they listen to everything that I'm saying about bowling, trust me, it is the furthest thing from the truth. No chance. <laughs> yeah, I was there that day, and um, I want to I want to tell a story about that day myself. I, I remember looking over at you and Leslie up in the crowd, and um, – it was like David versus Goliath, let's face it. The, the little guy that was bowling against your son, mm-hmm. uh, just a little guy, you know, throwing it with two hands. Um, hadn't quite hit, or quite hit puberty, quite like. Right. <laughs> and it was like David versus Goliath. And it, what I thought was so interesting is, is, is after he won, you actually went over to the little guy and let him know that he should be proud of what he did. Yeah. I specifically remember that. You went straight to him. Mm-hmm. And I think that speaks to your character. You've you've always treated everyone fairly. Um, in my opinion, you you are you follow in the footsteps of the of the greatest uh, ambassadors of the game, like Weber, Dick Weber, and you are our, our today, Dick Weber. And when I saw that, it just didn't surprise me at all. Where does that come from? It just comes from my heart. I want nothing but the best for anybody, and uh, it doesn't matter how many people are competing for the title. When it's all said and done. One person or one team is going to win. And unfortunately, somebody has to finish second. And I'm going to go further down the line. Unfortunately, someone's going to finish last. But when you look at it, we're all in it for the same reason. We put up our money or you pay an entry fee because you want to go out there and do the best you can and walk away with the check and trophy. Consoling the young man there or helping a fellow tour player if I'm in the middle of competition or or bowling somewhere else. And I, I remember looking at that little boy and telling him, you know what, please don't let it be a setting that you lost because I guarantee you, mom is going to take you for the biggest milkshake that her money can buy you when you get done here. And he cracked a big old smile. And, and to me, that means the world right then and there because he didn't realize how fast that time went by him. Yes, I know that he wanted to win, but he got there once and I've always lived by this rule. If I get there once, I'll get there again. And that's exactly one of the other things I, I told him. You you got there once, you'll get here again. Let's talk about uh, not only your family being all bowling, then you got this guy named Doug Kent who becomes a relative also through marriage. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that. How did you become brother-in-law with, with Doug Kent and what's your relationship like with Doug? Uh, my relationship with Doug is fantastic. We get along great together. There's nothing that we, we can't do together. We see everything eye to eye. Uh, you know, he owns a bowling center right now in upstate New York, and that's what he's chosen to do, and that's great. It's working out perfect for them. Although I don't own a bowling center, you know, I travel basically all over the world trying to promote bowling and doing what I feel is right. Uh, I guess you could say I don't have to worry about the bowling center. It's something not going right. You know, the ice machine didn't work. The lane machine didn't work. Sure. Lane five is broke down. we got to <laughs> fix it because we got the league starting in 30 minutes. Uh-huh. There, there's a lot of those headaches that I'm going to tell you right now that I know Doug has to deal with on, it, on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, I'm going to knock on wood when I say this, that the main thing that Parker has to worry about is his ball rolling down the lane properly or getting from one city to the next. And uh, that, that, that's really all I want to be concerned with. But family-wise, we all get along great. Uh, he started going out with Chrissy, I'll say a year or two after Leslie and me started going out. And him and Chrissy got a, a great thing that they got up there in New York. They got a lot of heart and soul for everybody that goes in the Air Center. Uh, just like I say, Leslie and me have the same heart and soul for everybody that we come across or, or cross paths with. What would you say is your greatest accomplishment on the lanes? Which one sticks out to you? My greatest accomplishment? Winning a tournament that had my name on it really meant a lot and and when i say that because people don't understand the tv and radio that you had to do at seven o'clock in the morning or the tv interviews that went on at eleven twenty-five at night on the sports the local sports station there in albany um that would rank up there but the single most handedly greatest accomplishment the one that i will never ever forget will be winning the world championship right after Superstorm Sandy hit the East Coast. Mm, that's right. Uh, we had this this big storm that, that 
I'll say, paralyzed the East Coast there. And I remember it vividly. Uh, you know, the iconic image that everybody remembers is the roller coaster that was sitting in the ocean. It's only about 25 minutes from my house where I grew up at home. And, uh, you know, we had lost power. We didn't have power for three days. Okay, it took me two days to clean my yard, which is not a big deal. Because the neighbor next to me lost 10 trees. And out of his 10 trees, one of his big oaks went through his other neighbors, right through his two cars that were sitting in the driveway. Okay, so there were a lot of people that lost a lot of stuff. So for me, cleaning up my yard was really minuscule. But I didn't get a chance to roll a ball down the lane. Couldn't practice for three days because nobody had power. It didn't matter where you went. There was gas rationing going on. Gas stations couldn't pump their gas. And then lo and behold, Thursday night, I remember the power came back on. And it, I knew that Leslie was okay with the kids once the power came back on. And, and my dad only lives about five minutes, ten minutes from us. So, you know, if she really needed something, she had him too. But I was able to uh, talk to her and change my flight and I went out the following day. I missed some of the practice session for some of the other squads and kicked up for the last two practice sessions and, and went and bowled the tournament. And, you know, as it would unfold, I did not make any cut in the individual tournaments, but I snuck in as 24th. The number. The number at the big tournament. And then we bowled 24 games of, ne of match play. And I sneak in at number five for the big tournament. Well, now, back at home, they had a 10-inch snowstorm or 12-inch snowstorm that came after the big snowstorm. Guess what? That knocked out power again for three more wow. days. So everybody's upside down. And I said to her, I said, you know what, babe? I, I snuck into the TV show. Why don't you and the kids get up to the airport? Come on out here. And they came. And it was at that point that the kids were old enough to actually watch me participate on TV and bowl for, well, bluntly, probably what would be the most elusive or the biggest title of my career the 2013 PBA World Championship. And who, who did you have to beat on that step ladder that day? And it started out with Dan McClellan. Then it went to Rhino Page. Then it went to my good friend, Sean Rash. And ultimately, uh, the guy that's bowled unbelievably the last five or six years, Jason Belmonte. Yeah, it was an incredible day. I remember talking to Barnes, and I said, I think it's Parker's day. Just the, the, the stars are going to align today with all the style, the background, and everything that was going on. And you just seemed really focused that day. It just seemed like it was your day. Everybody was rooting for you. And uh, you had the kids right there. And that was just a memorable moment. I remember it. you were wearing an orange, blue, and white jersey that day. Yep. You still have it? I, I certainly do. Leslie will not let me get rid of that. You keep your old bowling balls? <laughs> I don't keep my old bowling balls. Mike Albee keeps his old bowling balls. He's got all the balls that he bowled 300 <laughs> with and won PBA titles. I don't know how he's got room in his basement for anything else. But uh, I, I've actually got... Uh, the bowling ball I won my first PBA national title with, I've got the bowling ball that I won cracked $1 million, $2 million, and $3 million, respectively. I still have uh, those three bowling balls. Uh, I've got the bowling ball at home that I rolled my first regular 300 with, uh, just any 300 game. It was in a JBT back at home. Uh, but outside of those, I've got the bowling ball that I bowled 300 with on national TV. I do have that. Are those gold pens? Those were the gold pins. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, those were the gold pins right at the stadium. So another memorable day. But, uh, yeah, I've got maybe about eight or ten special bowling balls for that reason. But I, I can't keep all the other ones. Uh, what's your greatest accomplishment uh, that you can think back to that was out, outside of the lanes? Oh, boy. You spent a lot of time in bowling centers, so there's not a whole lot of time for yeah, something not that's a lot not of bowling time. related. There's not a lot of time outside of the lanes. Probably... Uh, if I had to say something outside of the lanes, one of uh, my greatest accomplishments, would I'm going to say bluntly, is my family. I enjoy family time as much as the next guy. And I put my heart and soul into everything I do when I'm on the lanes. Through thick and thin, and God knows that I've had my, share, my fair share of bad days. There's no question about it. But it makes the really good days totally, totally memorable because you know the heart and soul and passion you've put into it. But when I get my opportunity to walk away and I can spend a day or two with just my family, I do cherish those moments. And some of those moments, you know, I'm going to laugh when I say it, could be working in my own backyard or being with my family at my house. But some of those moments, obviously, are doing something with all of them, especially Leslie, that we, we can share together. Do you have a bucket list? Oh, <laughs> 
the bucket list. You know, I, I don't know if the bucket list is there necessarily. I laugh when I say that because when you accomplish one thing, then you got to come up with something else to make. You know, my dream when I first met, went out on tour, the dream, Mike, and you're going to laugh at this one, I wanted to say before I quit the PBA tour that I at least won numero uno. I won a PBA title. I wanted to be a PBA champion. I think I accomplished that one pretty easily. Yeah, 35 times Fortunately. over. Then I wanted to make, earn $100,000 in a year. Well, I had 14 consecutive years of doing that. Then I wanted to be PBA player of the year one year. Then I did that. Fortunately, I was able to do it again. Um, if I had a bucket list right now or something, the next goal oriented that maybe, maybe PBA senior player of the year, you know, I'd certainly like to win another PBA tour title. I don't know if it's in the cards, but I can tell you right now, I'm not giving up. You know, I'm going to look at my schedule a little bit more diligently. Uh, there are certain things that I'm going to do right now where maybe the tour doesn't have a hundred percent capacity for Parker bone, but a lot of that has to do with my two boys. And, and although we didn't mention her before my daughter, Sydney, she's into it too now, you know, so getting or the excitement of being dad and watching them have success on the lanes. I have no problem with that. I'm totally fine with it. It's awesome. What do you do on a day that you're not bowling? What's a, what's a good day for you, for just you forget the family, just you alone being selfish, which you're not. What, what is it? What is just a good day look like for you? <laughs> working in my backyard, working around my house, uh, trimming bushes, cleaning the pool, uh, cleaning up the backyard, mowing the grass. It's just an outdoor activity. I don't want to be inside. We are inside all the time. I'm not ever the one that's going to shy away from work. I'll dig into the trenches. I don't care what it is, how it is, how much manual labor it takes. But I know that when I'm done doing the job, I can look at it and cross my arms and go, that there, that was a great time today. I got something accomplished. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I love cutting the grass. I listen to podcasts, actually, when I cut the grass these days. I kind of cut out listening to music. Do you listen to any podcasts yourself? I haven't had the opportunity to listen to too many of them. Uh, I will tell you that in time, I'm certainly going to look forward to listening to hours here. <laughs> you know, but uh, And although my grass is not that big, this podcast might be a little bit longer than it takes me to cut the grass. Yeah, probably, probably. <laughs> I want to name some uh, some bowlers from over the years, and you can either tell a story or just some words uh, that you think of when you when you hear the name. Uh, Dick Weber, probably the greatest ambassador that our sport ever knew. I mean, it, anything that when you listen to people that talked about Dick Weber or knew Dick Weber, they knew that it was a genuine human being that never forgot anything remembered everything and more importantly treated everyone that he ever come in touch with as a legitimate friend of his earl anthony earl anthony greatest bowler i'm going to say greatest bowler of all time with the exception of walter ray and i'm going to get back to that in a little bit but what he accomplished on the lanes in the 1970s of my opinion will be totally unparalleled to any bowler in modern era and uh you know, Belmo has a chance to get to that. There's still a couple more years left in our decade as we know it. But, uh, my God, when you look at what he went through with a 10-year stretch, whew, good luck for anybody matching that. Uh, you said Walter Ray. Um, let's talk about Walter Ray. The greatest bowler of all time in my eyes. And, uh, you know, obviously the battle goes back and forth between Earl Anthony and, and Walter Ray. Uh, I've got to give the notch towards Walter Ray. Earl Anthony, as great as he was, and may he rest in peace, And you know, because I know he's not here to, to battle this stipulation. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But uh, it was his choice to retire in, at the age of 42 or 43. And Walter Ray kept going. Walter Ray didn't decide to retire. Now, for whatever the reasons, everybody's got their own reasons, you know, here or there. And we're not going to knock any individual one way or the other. But Walter Ray accomplished an additional player of the year, a handful, if not 10 more titles, after he was 43. And when you look at what he's accomplished, even to today's game, how can you turn around hands down and say he's not the greatest bowler of all time? 
in the long run. For the short haul, Earl Anthony has that notch for that 10-year span. But in the overall haul, I got to give it to Walter Ray Williams. Pete Weber. The greatest natural talent to ever hit a bowling lane. There's nobody that naturally has come out on tour and done some of the things that he can do. Obviously, we all know that he's not afraid to get up there and throw it any any time he needs it. But that being said, he can back it up with not only his charisma on the lanes, but when it comes down to needing it or, or getting the job done, Pete's not afraid to get the job done. So I'm going to say greatest natural talent ever. And the last one for you, Johnny Petraglia. Johnny Petraglia. What more can you say about a man that has put his heart, soul, and dedication into the great sport that every one of us know and love? He served our country, or he bowled out on tour first, then went and served our country, then came back and continued to bowl on tour. And the things that he does to this day for veterans around the United States is unbelievable. And I'm sure that there are other gentlemen or ladies out there that do something very similar to what Johnny Petraglia does. But he supports the tour. He bowls the tour. He's never forgotten his brothers and sisters that have fought in the wars, be it overseas or, you know, maybe somewhere here locally and something that's going on there. But when you look at everything he's accomplished and the family man that he is, that, that once again, it's one of those things that gives you chills when you think about it. What is the toughest day that you've had in your life? <laughs> the toughest day that I've had? Oh, or my just goodness. a bad day? A bad day in my life. You got some bad news? Um, well, when you, I'd say that anybody's day can really get ruined or tarnished when you lose a loved one. Um, you know, knock on wood, and I'm going to knock on as much wood as I can around here, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> But uh, uh, fortunately, my parents are both still alive. And uh, I know it was definitely not a very good day in, in our household when my wife unfortunately lost her dad. Okay, that's, that's a sad, sad day there. Uh, I've got one sister. Her kids are good. All of my kids seem to be fine. Uh, losing my grandparents, that's going to be a sad day for anybody. But uh, I would say outside of losing a loved one, any day that's bad, go look at somebody else. You know, I tell people all the time, my, my good friend Josh Hyde lives in a wheelchair 24 hours a day outside of laying in a bed. You think that ring in 10, you think that pocket 7, 10, you think that solid 8 is really bad? Why don't you go live in his shoes for a week or two? Let me know how you feel about that solid 8 or ring in 10 right now. You know, and, and once again, it gets me touched up thinking about him, but players people in general think that they're having a bad day go look left and look right somebody else is having one worse than you absolutely i couldn't agree with you more all right i guess i got a couple quick questions here for you if christmas was tomorrow what would you want peace throughout the world happiness sounds cliche but for, for everybody you know i i mean not everybody's going to win a pba tour title not everybody's going to win a regular bowling tournament but if you go out there and then you enjoy yourself and you treat your fellow neighbor or the guy next to you just like you would Earl Anthony or Dick Weber, you know what? It's not very hard. I try to treat every guy or lady out here that I come in contact with the same as I would my own friends at home. I don't care what they've accomplished or what they haven't accomplished. It's not very hard. And if we all treated everybody with respect and dignity, I think the world would be a much better place. If you had to watch one movie for 24 hours on a loop, what movie would it be? Uh, I always said it was Ten Commandments. I liked that movie. I really did with Charlton Heston. Uh, and I know I'm showing my age because that movie hasn't been at, necessarily on TV here lately, but uh, I, I really did love that movie. It was uh, pretty amazing to watch everything, the way that it unfolded. And, and to this day, I, I, I would probably say that would be my 24-hour loop. Uh, you could take Leslie uh, away on vacation just to get away from everything. Where would you take her and what would you do? Uh, well, we just came back not long ago from Australia and New Zealand. That's pretty far away. I'm not going to take her to the moon, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, 
probably, a, a, I'd say, a tropical island somewhere. You know, when you can get away from everything and uh, you can kick back and you're watching or listening to the water hit the shore and you don't have to worry about storms or anything and you know that your family is safe at home, that's probably what I would do. Take her to some tropical place that I knew she could enjoy her sunshine. I could enjoy sunshine a little bit. All right, I might get bored way before she will, but I'll guarantee at the end we're going to enjoy ourselves. To any young influencer out there, whether they get hooked up with a company because they're popular on Instagram or maybe it's a bowler out there that's looking to try to get signed on or they get their first ball contract, what is your advice on what they should deliver for the company that believes in them? Probably the biggest piece of advice I I could say to them would be give everything you've got back to the company that's supporting you, okay? That company believes in you. When I say believe in you, they know that you're going to have good days and they certainly know that you're going to have bad days. But if you don't let those bad days put you in the dumps and you learn something by it, then now you can turn around and make that day even better and then your really good days can become great days. So by giving 110% on behalf of yourself for the company or brand that you represent, then I think that you're doing the right thing for the company that wants you. This is the opportunity now. If you would like to ask me any question or tell the, <laughs> tell the audience something that uh, we didn't cover here today or some final words. All right, Mike. Well, let, let's see. We can start to show your age a little bit. How old were you when I won my first title in 1987? I was eight years old. Great. That makes me feel wonderful right now. <laughs> to all the, the viewers that are listening. Hey, at least I was born. This is true. This is true. You you, you were around at least. Uh, Tour-wise, you've been around bowling for a number of years. Mm-hmm. In your eyes, why is the professional side of the sport not something that you wanted to take? Well, I actually did. I actually did want to be a pro bowler, but I lacked the work ethic and the difference is I'm somebody that if I want to get good grades I have to study and learn it I can't just look at it once Uh, I have to really work at it and bowling was the same way Uh, so I had success when I was 13 years old I bowled a 300 game I bowled junior gold the first year and cashed and you know, won college scholarships and was one of the better bowlers out of the St. Louis area. I'd go bowl teen masters, youth masters, all that kind of stuff. Uh, But I had to work at it. I had to bowl every day um, because I was a field player. I didn't have the greatest uh, fundamentals or arm swing. And when I would take three, four, five days off, it took me that much longer to get back in rhythm, know my equipment. And I ended up having to go to work. Um, a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and I just never had the opportunity to keep working at it. And I just, I felt the numbers were stacked against me and it wasn't a smart business decision. No, so that's fine. At least you were honest with yourself though. Yeah. So I took the other path of how can I help grow bowling and create other opportunities for other people and, and shine a spotlight on bowling as much as I can by running bowling centers and then getting into the product side and then the digital marketing side and the live streaming and all that stuff and all the way up to this brand new podcast I'm doing. Well, certainly appreciate it because it's something that's helping promote bowling and anything that's helping promote bowling from my heart. I can't thank you enough for doing your part. Now the one last question. Okay. All right. All right. I like I'm going to put you on the spot here now. All right. Since you've asked me about so many things about my bowling, mm-hmm. I want you to tell the listeners, what is one of the funniest things that happened to you in bowling? Okay. Um, I was bowling collegiate for Lindawood University, and I had just transferred from Central Missouri. Um, I got in a little bit of trouble at Central Missouri, and uh, Coach Ron Holmes had basically, uh, I, I, I couldn't bowl. Let's just put it that way. I didn't break the law or anything, but it just wasn't a good situation. So I left, and I transferred back to St. Louis to be closer to family, and I went to Lindenwood University that had just founded a bowling program, some of my buddies that I bowled the Travel League with and whatnot. And I went to my first tournament with Lindenwood University. It was the Buckeye Classic at Palace Lanes in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Mm-hmm. And it was the very first game of the tournament. Central Missouri was there as well, and it was just kind of a weird thing for me. And I bowled leadoff. 
and I threw the front nine. I was bowling really good. Great. Um, yeah, and I went up in the tenth frame on my very first shot, and the guy right behind me, the guy's name was Todd Pagano. He was the two hole bowler, very good friend of mine, and uh, I. Everybody was kind of stopping and paying attention now, and I uh, let go of the ball, and the ball duck hooked at the arrows and kind of rolled out and went Brooklyn for a strike. I came back, high five my teammates and <laughs> said, you know, this is, th- that was just not a good shot, obviously. So I'm going to go make a good shot, go up very next shot. Same thing happens. Duck hooks at the arrows, ball rolls out, it goes Brooklyn. Meanwhile, everybody's, you know, watching this and I went Brooklyn. So you got the front 11 with two Brooklyns in the mm-hmm. tent so far. Mm-hmm. So I, I moved <laughs> seven and three. Pretty big move, yeah. and I flushed it and shot 300. It was the first 300 in Lindenwood University history. And the, the coach was Mike Hallway, who's since passed away. But he told the story, and every year he exaggerated two to three more boards, the move that I had. <laughs> and I still have people that come up to me once in a while and say, that was a really ballsy move. You moved four arrows left with your feet and two with your eyes and shot 300. I never heard anything like it. So, hey, you got the job done. That's I, all that mattered when it was said and I done. Did. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I enjoy the time. Thanks for sitting down with me. And, um, man, it's been a pleasure. Enjoyed every bit of it. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that as much as I did. I really appreciated my time with Parker. And I think a couple of things to take away from this one is, first of all, I wanted to try to get him outside of talking about bowling. So I started asking him some questions towards the end of the interview, as you heard, about bucket list items and things like that. And he just stayed right in that bowling lane, pun intended. He just wanted to keep talking bowling. And I think that really speaks to what Parker's life is all about. It's bowling 24-7 for Mr. Bone and his entire family. And good on them. You know. Also, I think we learned throughout the podcast that his values and morals are very, very high. When I asked him what his favorite movie was, he said Ten Commandments. Uh, and he just leads a life and treats everyone with the same amount of respect. And that's something I think we could all do a better job of. So the other thing that, that I took away from that interview is back in 2018, I asked him, you know, bucket list. And he didn't tell me that he wanted to skydive or do anything interesting. Uh, he stayed right in the bowling lane, as I mentioned. And he said PBA 50 Player of the Year would be another item on his bucket list. The only thing he hadn't done. And how cool is it that he won four titles this year on the PBA 50 Tour. And that he was able to uh, knock that one off the bucket list. So another reason why I brought this one out uh, now here today. So hopefully you enjoyed this interview. I appreciate you listening to it. I do have a few other ones, and uh, give me a comment down below or review the podcast if you're listening in audio format. Uh, I certainly would like to hear some feedback from you on what you thought of it, or maybe any other guests in the future you'd like for me to sit down with. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for me here today. Thank you for watching. I'll see you on the next one.